one side um, uh, uh, managed to put my diabetes <laughs> into remission, you know, one of the things that you, you feel uh, is that you want to, you know, stand on a rooftop and start shouting it out and saying, look, there's so many other people out there that must be like me that are desperately trying to do something about the diabetes and, and, uh, and, and feel that it's almost like a, uh, a worthless cause. You're just never going to get anywhere. So I wanted to, um, with my new increased energy and enthusiasm, I wanted to try and do something and give, some, give something back. So <laughs> Okay, good morning. Hopefully you guys can hear me all right. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Mark Hancock, uh, joining us, <clears throat> I believe, from the UK. Is, is that is that fair to say, Mark? Can you hear me okay? Oh, that's it. Yeah, down uh, near a city called Portsmouth on the south coast. Portsmouth. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, for taking the time to do that. I know it's kind of what early evening there, I think, where you're at, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, welcome to our little community here. We've had some, uh, I think we had some uh, Jen Unwin the other day, and then we had, uh, uh, who else did we have? It's two days ago, another fellow from the UK, one of the pharmacists that, that, that works with the organization, the uh, Public Brent Health Graham, was that? UK, which I believe, yeah, exactly right, yeah, and, and I believe uh, that's who you are involved with, is that correct? With the, the public health collaboration, yes, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was, um, yeah, in, uh, invited to become an ambassador for them a uh, um, uh, couple, of, two or three years ago now, I think. Might mean a bit, bit, bit longer than that, but uh, yeah, it's something that was very close to my heart after my own battles with health. So uh, I couldn't wait to try and help other people. Yeah, well, let, let's let's talk, let's talk about that. If you just tell us a little bit about your background, and then we can maybe get into your particular uh, your health particular story. Thank you. Yeah, that's great, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, uh, I uh, I'm 51 years old, um, uh, but back in 2010, I was 39, and uh, uh, I was uh, just had a routine blood test, and I was told that I was type two diabetic, uh, which if anyone's had that um, uh, that feeling when they get been given news like that, it is pretty much a heart sinking moment. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't really know what to do, um, uh, but I sort of tried my best. I got given all the advice, the normal typical advice that you get from your uh, from your GP and surgery and uh, uh, and was put on medication right from the beginning uh, and, uh, and, and then stayed on that for, uh, for six years. Um, whilst doing everything I possibly could to, to slow this chronic and progressive disease that I was told that I had, uh, which was starting to progress despite doing bags of exercise, um, it, uh, it seemed to be getting uh, to a situation where uh, they were telling me that I had to have my meds uh, increased and be put on statins and increase the diabetes medication. Um, and, until it was just by complete luck that I, I heard a TV doctor uh, who's well known over in the UK on the radio, on BBC radio. And he was saying that perhaps we've got all this wrong. Uh, and from that moment, it didn't take too long to uh, turn the diabetes around and get myself back to normal blood sugars. Who, who was the doctor you were listening to just out of curiosity? It was Dr. Michael Maisley. Oh, he's, yeah, what's the five, two fast guy. Yeah, exactly. That's right. it. That's it. Yeah. So he'd, he'd um, was citing some work from Professor Roy Taylor uh, in Newcastle University who'd uh, proven uh, at that point that diabetes could be reversed or put into remission. Um, and, uh, and so I was quite interested to hear um, a little bit more about that. In fact, I'd actually heard about that um, a couple of years before. Um, and, uh, and when I'd spoken to my diabetes nurse at the time, she said, no, you wouldn't be able to do it. And as soon as you go back to eating the way that you were before, the diabetes would just return. So, you know, it, she put me off it really um and I, I remember at the time feeling a bit disheartened because i thought this is something else i can throw myself into i'd already started doing lots of running and um i was doing half marathons and marathons by that point but uh yeah it, it was a bit disheartening to think that that although there seemed to be an answer it was kind of very quickly taken away yeah let me ask you because you, you said type 2 diabetes and um when you were diagnosed i mean was there 
did you have, were you, did you go to the doctor because you felt bad or what, what was it? I mean, were you overweight at the time? You talk about marathons and stuff like well, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I mean, I was overweight. I mean, I'm six foot three. So I, I think I kind of covered it off <laughs> fairly well. I think when you're tall, you can kind of wrap it up in a suit. Um, and I worked at one of the UK banks um, as a financial advisor. Um, so running here and there, uh, but at, at, but around that time, I think it was about 2000, I said with that time, a few years before, I left the bank and set up a business on my own um, as a financial advisor. And, um, and it was a few years later after running through things, very stressful situations, like I've got a young family, um, we had the financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, and that didn't help either. So um, I think I was throwing myself into food. I put on a quite a bit of weight. I was sort of getting towards 17 stone, really. And um, I wanted to sort out some life cover. Some, something was telling me I needed to go and get some more life cover. Um, so um, part of the process is that you get a nurse to come around and run some tests on you. And, uh, and she said, at that point, she said, oh, I think you're you know, she, she mentioned something called glucose plus one. And, uh, uh, and I said, is that something to do with diabetes? And she said, well, you need to go and have some tests at the GP and they'll, and they'll let you know. And so they sent me off for some tests. They sent me off for some more tests. Um, and then I didn't hear anything. And then I thought, well, perhaps I need to phone the doctors and find out what's going on. And, uh, and they said, oh, we're glad you phoned because we need to put you in the diabetes nurse. So it was at that point, you know, I, I found out, but you know, I, I can't say it was a massive shock because it was been through my family, my mum, my dad, my brother, my uncle, my grandmother, they, they all had type 2 diabetes. Um, so, you know, to be honest, it was probably just yeah, about like yeah, it was a massive so time. We do, yeah, we do see some level of, uh, you know, familial uh, uh, relationships with that, whether it runs into a genetic genetic uh, uh, factors or just lifestyle factors that come within different families is kind of debatable. Was your, so what was your diet like prior to um, the diagnosis of diabetes? And then what was it after you found out and started doing all the running and, and weren't able and still were not able to uh, sort of put it into remission? Uh, well, beforehand, um, I think, you know, I wasn't eating particularly well. I was grabbing things like, um, bready baguettes and, and that type of thing but between meetings i'd be late nights in the office we'd grab takeaways that would be a regular thing that i would eat i thought i was eating fairly well at home um you know we would eat things like a, a pasta meal with some chicken and a, a you know a, a sauce that would be bought in the shop uh, and you felt that that was the right thing i was eating um, breakfast cereals that seemed to be okay it's not as if i was eating you know chocolate uh, cocoa pops or something every every morning you know I seem to be eating things that I thought were the normal sorts of things to eat and then I guess the typical lunch would be something bready and then maybe a pack of the crisps or a chocolate bar or those types of things so I guess it's fairly standard that's I've been eating perhaps a little bit too much on the takeaways but a fairly standard kind of diet uh, leading up to the diabetes and it at the point I was diagnosed, of course, the first thing I did was think about cutting out the things that I thought were harming me. So, you know, straight away, it was a case of, right, no more takeaways, not having any of those. Um, and, and of course, we then started following the advice that the, the diabetes nurse had given me, uh, which was to make little swaps. So it was, instead of having things like white rice, she was telling me to have things like basmati rice, which we'd never really heard of before. Um, but because we heard that it was healthy now it was a case of I didn't it wasn't just me eating it but my wife my children um and uh, and so we were following those instead of having white bread we were having brown bread um uh, and white uh, pasta brown pasta that type of thing so it's, it was more sort of like little swaps that we'd made once once been diagnosed and to be honest I did lose a bit of weight to start off with um and then throwing myself into doing running um, you know, it sort of helped as well. Um, so I felt like I was doing the right things. Yeah. And, and what was, what was the, you know, when they said your diabetes is not responding to running or getting worse. I mean, how did they determine, did they say your, your hemoglobin A1C was remaining up or glucose was up, or were you seeing actual, uh, damage occurring, you know, whether it's blood pressure or, uh, kidney issues or anything like that? How did, how did they make that decision? Well, I had 
I had this sort of uh, diabetic retinopathy, which was which was um, uh, disappointing because I felt like I'd, especially in that first year, I thought I'd really thrown myself into it and done everything um, that was asked of me, and and I hadn't had it the year before, and then of course then it was saying that I did have it uh, twelve months or so after after diagnosis. Um, I had a little tingling feeling in my feet, but that had been going on for for quite a while, and. I didn't really, it, it's an interesting thing with diabetes because it's a lot of little things that sort of pop on you and you don't really pay too much attention to it. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, my condition, were, it seemed to get better initially, apart from the diabetic retinopathy, it seemed to get better. Um, but then they said, by the time we got to 2016, uh, six years later, they said, well, your um, cholesterol, we're not happy with your cholesterol. We want to put you on statins. Um, uh, the medication that you've been on up till now doesn't seem to be doing enough. And your numbers are starting to go, your hba one c is starting to go back up again. Um, and uh, and I, I remember saying to the nurse at the time, saying, I'm doing everything I can. You know, I'm, I'm following what you're telling me to eat. Um, and, you know, we were all told that we're supposed to do 150 minutes of prescribed moderate exercise a week. I'm doing way beyond that with all the, the running and everything that I'm doing, but my condition is getting worse. And they said, well, we always told you it was chronic and progressive. And, and uh, so it, it felt, I felt a bit powerless at that point. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating. And, and, you, and you, you know, your point, your observation that this is this little slow, and it is a slow progressive disease for people that don't sort of treat it correctly. Uh, and I think nutrition is, is probably the correct treatment, but, you know, you see it. Your feet's a little bit numb, you'll blow it off, and then maybe, you know, maybe you have some aches and pains that you just contribute to. Maybe it's aging where maybe it's actually glycation of tissues and you know, on and on and on. And you see these things. So now how did you get to so 2016 diabetes were six years on? When did you make a just you, know, you saw Mosley talking? So how did that how did that go? Because you know, obviously you're there you I and again, I don't know what your dietary switch was, but I assume it was something that was not going to make your cholesterol better according to conventional doctors. So how did you, how did you make that uh, leap? Um, and how did you deal with the concerns well, around what was going on? It, it, it was a leap, uh, a leap of faith really, because, but then I felt like I had nothing to lose because I thought I'm, I've got a condition that's getting worse. So, you know, whatever I do from this point, what difference is it really going to make? They're only going to be increasing my medication anyway. Um, and, um, uh, Michael Mosley had, had brought out a book uh, and I said to my wife at the time that I'm going to get the book. Um, I'm going to follow what it says in there. And I don't care whether I, you know, if the food tastes like cardboard, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to follow it um, and just see what happens. And, and being in the kind of the, the role I am, um, I, you know, I like a spreadsheet. And so I was working out all my numbers. I hadn't really paid a huge amount of attention to things like uh, finger prick tests, glucose tests, that type of thing. I hadn't really or hadn't really had a, a proper uh, formula when when would be time to do it. Um, so I I, I, ha I I looked at it and sort of thought, well, I'm going to test before a meal. I'm going to test in the morning. I'm going to test after a meal. You know that type of thing. Um, and so I knew what my numbers were at at the start. But the thing that amazed me was that he pretty much was turning everything that we've been told on his head. Um, and whereas I was being told that, you know, I had to base my meals around all these starchy carbohydrates, um, he was saying, well, actually, no, that was the thing that was leading to the condition to being chronic and progressive. Uh, and actually the foods that I've been avoiding, so the things like um, um, high, higher fat or normal fat, I would say, uh, normal fat type, type products, whereas I've been told you've always got to go for the low fat versions of things. Um, he was saying, no, actually embrace that, you know, enjoy that in, in your meals and don't be worried about things, eating eggs and, and meat and, and fish and those types of things, and, you know, enjoy it. Um, so I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. Let's go for it. I, I had a different diabetes nurse by, by and, and uh, I spoke to her and she said, go for it. Keep me updated. She said, because one of my other patients has tried it and they've had a lot of success. So I thought, Great. And that was all the incentive I needed. I had somebody now who was actually giving me that, that kind of push to go for it. Um, so I did. I got my spreadsheet. I was working on my numbers. I couldn't believe that how quickly things changed. I mean, I, in that first week, I lost nine pounds in weight. 
I mean, I know clearly some of that's going to be water weight, but it's incredibly motivating when you're seeing that your weight is starting to come back down again. Um, and my blood sugar levels dropped down pretty quickly. It just those first few days. Um, and uh, by the end of the week, I was getting uh, readings of um, uh, four early fours, that type of thing, even late threes. And I felt, well, I need to, I need to chat to my nurse and ask her, you know, what, what, what is this okay? What should I be doing? And and um, and she said, you don't need the medication anymore, um, which was incredible. I mean, I, you know, even now I still think it was a stunning feeling at the time to think that my meds were going to go up. And then within a week, I was coming off them. Yeah, that, that, that's got to feel good. And I think the, the observation you made, which I think is wonderful, you know, you said these things are normal fat. You know, everything else is low fat. And I think about it, you know, it's like normal fat, a whole egg, you know, a piece of meat with the normal amount of fat that comes with it naturally, you know, uh, you know, fish, uh, you know, uh, you know, those types of things are normal fat. And then we have everything else that's low fat or we have high fat where maybe you would say these oils that are processed, you know, maybe concentrate creams and butters would be higher fat. But I think when you talk about normal fat, it's like a whole food like it's been like we've been eating for, gosh, who knows how long. But so now you're off. You come off the med. What medications were you on, by the way? You didn't mention the name of the medications. If you want to share uh, that. Metformin. Metformin. So I was on two metformin a day at that point and they okay. wanted to increase the metformin more. Okay, so still relatively early in the disease, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some diabetics are on, I mean, four or five different medications for, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, several for diabetes and then a bunch of other medications, you know, blood pressure, cholesterol lowering medications, and blood thinners, on and on and on, which is kind of a typical, typical presentation for a lot. Um, so you lost nine pounds. Did you, so what about the retinopathy? Did we, did you ever follow up on that? Did you see, was that able to improve at any one point? It's, uh, it, we get tested every year. So, um, so yeah, we got to a point after a few years uh, where it, that I, I started getting um, tests saying that there weren't any issues. So it was starting, it was starting to prove and I felt it gave me that kind of confidence that everything was, was going right and it was going in the right, right direction. But even now I still get, I still get tested. But it, it, you know, it's interesting what you were saying, just picking up on what you were saying about the normal fat i mean here in the uk and i assume you get this in the us as well is that we've got like traffic light systems on foods and you think of something like a piece of fish and and it will be, it will have fat content on it and it'll be in red as if like this is something to be avoided um and so you know you you do feel and and with people that i speak to now there's still that kind of almost like a hesitation am i doing the right thing you know is this going to lead to me having worse cholesterol because everyone seems to be getting wor worried about cholesterol. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, it, 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 it does make you stop and think, but then you always get to a point where you think you've got nothing to lose and let's go for it. Yeah. I think in just, to, so what happened with your cholesterol? Did it go up as you increased the fat in your diet? What, what, what was the effect that you had? Uh, my total cholesterol went up. Okay. Yeah, my total cholesterol went up, uh, but my HDL doubled and my triglycerides came down um, really quickly. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we're, um, uh, we're able to sort of go back and have a look at our numbers and things before. So I know around the time uh, my tri triglycerides were, were two at diagnosis. Um, and I, I, I have mine tested now uh, uh, in recent times and they're exceptionally low. So it's not like, I know it was like 0.6 or something like that. It was, um, you know, completely different. But of course, you know, there was still that sort of feeling. I remember going back to see a different doctor about something else, because in the UK, you don't always get to see the same doctor. Um, and, uh, uh, and this was after putting my diabetes in remission and they, um, remarked on my cholesterol and said, oh, you know, your total cholesterol is up. Has anybody talked to you about statins? And I thought, here we go. Let's have a conversation then. And of course, you know, when you do start talking a little bit more about it, you actually realize, well, you know, to be honest, we're still pushing people on this total cholesterol um, thing. Um, and people do get worried about that. And that can, I guess it can make people hesitate a little bit before they do something, make yeah. a change. Yeah, certainly it does. And I think it's really important to, to point out the fact that, you know, when you were, you know, dealing with diabetes and you had higher blood glucose and lower cholesterol, 
you had retinopathy, you had microvascular disease was being evidenced in your eyes. You switch to a diet where your cholesterol goes up, but your glucose goes down, and that vascular disease improves and gets better and goes away. So I think that's that's particularly telling, I think. And I think when we look at, I mean, you know, I mean, the data that I'm seeing now coming out of studies and Women's Health Initiative showing that the biggest risk factor for cardiovascular disease is diabetes. I mean, it's blood glucose issues, and cholesterol has a very minor minor role in that. And so I think, you know, you're living proof of that, of that very same thing, because what's happening in your eyes is happening everywhere in your blood vessels. It's just, we can see it easier in our eyes because we have this, you know, neat way to look through, you know, fundoscopic view of the, of the eye. And, and we've got this window into our micro vessels that, uh, otherwise is hard to see. So that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, what other things gotten, have gotten better since, switching to a different <laughs> strategy <laughs> well I'm probably i'm probably in the, the best shape of my my life really um uh, in terms of uh you know i can say i'm at 50 51 years old um i know uh my energy was uh was a lot lower uh, i think my mood was a lot lower um and i think when your mood is lower you that doesn't help with your food choices either um and so that kind of lift it gives you i mean i i I remember at the time when I first started doing this, I, the first few days, it was, I, I felt like my energy levels went down even lower. And it was almost like my body was sort of saying, you know, what, what the hell are you doing? Um, we, we're not used to it. Um, and, uh, and I remember I got to the end of that first week and I just sort of just crashed out in the afternoon uh, and went to sleep. But the, but the, the next day I got up and I had this rush of energy. Uh, and to be honest, that has pretty much stayed with me, uh, you know, until until now. You have more energy. And when I speak to to others, um, you know, especially people who've, got, who've kind of gone through this, they say that, you know, when, when you had that, um, you come in from a, a long day at work and you just couldn't be bothered to cook and you couldn't be, you just wanted to put, in the in, in the oven for, for 20 minutes or whatever but now because they've got more energy they're able now to be able to go well look i'm going to make better choices um and you do hear that time and time again and the other thing that was great for me is that i can now cook i, I could never cook before uh and um uh you know apart from maybe throwing a roast dinner together or something like that that was pretty much my limit um whereas now i realize there isn't you know there's nothing mystical about it you know anyone can do it uh, and you can do things that are quite simple um whereas when i first started i was following every single recipe to the tea putting in herbs and spices and other bits and pieces and of course now you start to get a little bit more confident and uh and, and i love that i love the energy and i love being able to cook and i love being able to help other people do you know find out themselves how much uh, do you remember what your hemoglobin A1C readings were were at their worst and what they are now? And how much weight did you lose total? Uh, well, I'm, my, my weight now is down to around about 13 and a half. So I sort of, it sort of fluctuates between 13 and 13 and a half. Um, at that stone. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure what that will be in kilos. Yeah, multiplied, uh, but, multiplied by 14 pounds for you guys that don't understand stone. Yeah. So, so is it about 85, 85 kilos? I think. Uh, well, then I have but, to do a calculation. Yeah, I might have to do a bit, but, but, but it was about three servers so with 14. So, yeah, so yeah, it was quite, quite exactly a few right. pounds uh, that I, that I uh, lost in weight. Um, we had a different number, uh, how we used to track, track things, so it changed halfway through. So I know when I first started, she said your number was 10. And she said, you know, anyone under sort of six is probably is going to be OK. But you when you first came in, you were 10. Um, uh, and now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of marginal between diabetic and, and, and normal. And I think, you know, I've made even now, six years later, I'm making little tweaks and little changes to what I do. Cause I think pretty much we all do that. We start off, um, it going down a certain route and then you're making some changes as you go along. And, uh, and I made a change recently and, uh, and that's has seemed to have lowered my numbers again. So now I'm getting numbers that you know in the fours fairly regularly whereas probably a few weeks ago i was still getting sort of fives this fives in the early 60s um, and, and so, what, um, what was the change that you made recently just out of curiosity dark chocolate <laughs> i 
I, I realized, I know you had uh, Jen Onwin on here recently, and, and I think she talks about um, moderation um, and how difficult that is for a lot of people um, to actually say, well, you know, to have that that one piece of dark chocolate is never enough, um, and uh, and I can be one of those. Um, so I need be- very much boundaries as to what I should be eating and what I can and what I can do. And uh, uh, and if you speak to people in the low carb world, they'll say, well, dark chocolate, perhaps eighty five percent, going to be okay. Uh, uh, but you know, it's not okay if you have too much of it. Um, and just that one little change, I said, right, I'm not having it anymore. I'm not going to have that dark chocolate. Um, and, uh, and immediately my numbers came down another level. Um, so you never stop learning. And so I'm six years into it now. So interesting. And so just, just out of curiosity, uh, your diet, what does, what does today's diet look like for you? And, and, and the other thing, you know, the critics would say, because there's critics that say the low carb diets are no more efficacious than other diets for improving diabetes. And they'll say, there's a direct relationship between weight loss and your hemoglobin A1C going down, and it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you lose the weight. Um, one, do you find it easier to eat less on this type of diet? Do you have better appetite mm-hmm. control? And, you know, were you, uh, you know, did you have as good of a result when you lost weight on a higher carb diet, perhaps? Well, I did lose weight uh, initially. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I was first diagnosed, I, I lost weight. Um, and, yeah, my numbers improved marginally but then they started going back up again so you know i don't know what you can you can read into that um and the the interesting thing i find speaking to um uh, other people in the same situation as me is they don't necessarily need to lose a lot of weight for numbers to improve really dramatically very quickly so i'm not so sure that there is a complete direct correlation between losing weight and the diabetes controlled or making those, those changes in terms of nutrition so Uh, For me, typically now, I won't have breakfast. Well, that was completely unheard of (laughs) for me. I mean, that was kind of the thing that I would do first thing in the morning. That was the purpose of getting out of bed in the morning. Um, But now I find it very, very easy um, to uh, go long periods without eating. Um, So if I'm on the road, if I have to go and see, I know a client that might be a couple of hours away and traveling, um, in the past, I'd be thinking, well, where am I going to get food? Where am I going to eat? You know, what food do I need to take with me? Now I'm quite happy to go hours and hours and hours and not really need anything. Um, so it's almost like a bit a bit freeing. So I guess I, I kind of move between having two meals and sometimes only having one meal in a day. Um, and it's, it is strange because it's, it's like a habit forming thing that I think when I first started trying to give up breakfast, I, I felt hungry, but then it didn't take too long for my body to realize, actually, I don't, I'm not hungry now. I don't really need that food. In the same way as you wouldn't wake up in the middle of the night and go, I'm hungry. And your body can go eight, you know, eight hours without needing any food. So why can't it go, you know, 12 hours? Why can't it go 16 hours? Um, And and that's the sort of thing that I started finding out for myself, really, is that I could go longer periods. And of course, there was this I guess this concern that you know that if you're if you're eating the carbohydrate then actually you're eating lower calorie uh and if you're eating the fat you're eating sort of higher calorie but the actual total amount of food that i'm eating now is is a hell of a lot less uh than what i would have eaten before so you know if, if you look, look at it just from a I don't, I don't completely believe in the whole calorie theory but if you were looking at it i would still be eating a lot less in calories than I would have done before because I don't need don't keep getting hungry uh which I think is the thing that really stops people when they're trying to hit the health goals and they're just looking at counting calories yeah I mean some people that would be in favor of the calories in calories I would say well you've just proved it because you're eating less and you got a better health health outcome but I mean I think the nuance behind this is you know what about satiety has this, this big role in what you intake and then also, the nutrition is going to affect a little bit what our, what our caloric expenditure looks like to some degree, whether it's more protein, the thermic effect, whether it's debatable whether carbs or fat, you know, cause, uh, uh, you know, differential energy expenditure. That's still back. It's pretty well, con- very, 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 very hotly contested still. There's people like uh, David Ludwig, which would uh, adamantly say that there seems to be an effect. And he's done many, many studies that would support that, at least to some degree. And there's people that criticize that. What do you eat day to day? What does it look like? Just out of curiosity, are you eating uh, 
a plant-based high fat diet or you an animal-based food no, what's going on there? not really um, i i think as as time has gone by i've eaten more uh eggs uh steak um so we'll have chicken as well um but you know the focus is always where where's the protein on on the plate um you know i'm one of the things that we always when we're trying to help others um is you sort of tell them it's not all about salads uh, because I think traditionally that's what people think when they're going on a diet that they need to eat salads. Um, but actually, it's if you're focusing, or what we try to help them with is say is if you're focusing on those types of foods that are going to keep you fuller for longer, you're going to make it a lot easier for yourself. So you know, lunch today was a whole bunch of eggs. Um, so I had five eggs for lunch, um, which I love. Um, so that wasn't an issue. Um, and uh, and then tonight, I know I've got a bit of steak uh in in the fridge um so i'll have that and i might have some cut up some uh celeriac with it make it into like little celeriac chips um so uh so we to go with it so yeah that typically those are kind of the, the foods that i would eat on a, on a fairly regular basis i wouldn't say we would always have steak every night but um but it's going to be around the meat uh or fish uh, and, and eggs that type of thing do you have any concerns with, uh, you know, and I, I keep seeing, you know, and maybe maybe I just see the propaganda or the, or the inflammatory headlines coming out of the UK. And it's like, you know, we're going to, you know, force it. You know, I see in Ireland, they're trying to get rid of a million head of cattle or, ranch or, or livestock, you know, to, just to meet their climate targets. And they're really mm-hmm. pushing you to stop eating meat. And, and do you have concerns? Because that, that is what you're eating that is providing you with better health and if they were to take that away from you uh you'd be probably in a worse situation from your own health point do you do you have any concerns about that or is it do you feel like oh, that's gosh, yeah. Big thing? yeah absolutely because i think the trouble is is that once again we're pointing our finger at the thing that that we feel is the right thing to do but actually it's going to lead to worse health outcomes i i can't see how it wouldn't this is something that ancestrally we, we've eaten you know, for, for years and years and years, uh, thousands of years. So why would, if we took that away, why would suddenly our health improve and, I, and, and just went to, to plants? Um, I can't see how that would change anything except leading us more to eating processed foods. Um, and, you know, for me, that, that, that really is a, a, a big problem. It's a massive problem in the UK. I'm no doubt, obviously, you've got the same sort of issues. Uh, in in the US as well, where so many people are just eating processed um, and just buying packets of this and and not really eating the real foods. And and I think if if we if we focus on having a real food diet, you know, did 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 this food walk in a field? You know, did it swim in the sea? You know, um, and and you know, and did it grow? Um, if you can have a mix of of that type of thing, I don't think think you're going to go too far going to go too far wrong. Um, but it yeah, for me, it's the is the process, the ultra processed foods and the things that are packing out our supermarkets. These foods that clearly aren't real, but most people think they are. Yeah, I, I, I liken that to human pet food. And I think that is uh, uh, the state of our pets eat this on their food and they all get fat and diabetic. And uh, the humans do the same thing. Tell me a little bit about the Public Health Collaborative uh, in the UK and your role in that, how you got involved in that. And you said you were an ambassador and you presented in front of Someone, how, how did that evolve? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think one side um, uh, uh, managed to put my diabetes into remission. You know, one of the things that you, you feel uh, is that you want to, you know, stand on a rooftop and start shouting it out and say, look, there's so many other people out there that must be like me that are desperately trying to do something about the diabetes and, and, uh, and, and feel that it's almost like a, uh, a worthless cause, you're just never going to get anywhere. So I wanted to, um, with my new increased energy and enthusiasm, I wanted to try and do something and give something, give something back. So um, I, I approached local papers and local TV, um, radio, uh, and managed to uh, sort of share my story and get other people interested as well, which, which was wonderful. Um, but at the same time, you start looking online and you realise there's a whole a uh, huge amount of people out there that have started to do something very, very, very similar. And all 
uh, it was all pointing towards um, this, uh, the charity in the UK, the Public Health Collaboration, and they were having a conference uh, in 2017, uh, a few months after um, I, I, I'd gone through the remission. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to go. I mean, it was in the north of England, but I thought, I know I won't know anybody, but I'm looking at some of the people that are going to be talking here. And I thought, well, this will be a wonderful thing to get involved in. So I went up there and I had the absolute privilege to have a, a, a moment with Dr. David Unwin uh, uh, and um, uh, have a chat with him. And, uh, and you could see, you know, there were, there were doctors there, there were nurses that have been doing incredible work with their patients. Um, and there were a lot of patients there as well that really wanted to try and give something back and help, and help others. And so it was kind of a natural thing that when the, this ambassador program came out uh, within uh, the PHC, that it, we had the opportunity then to um, offer our sort of expert patient um, uh, way uh, with local surgeries. Um, so it was an opportunity to start almost networking with other surgeries and sort of saying, right, we might be able to help you. We might be able to help some of your patients. Um, not always easy because obviously, you know, as you know, there's still quite a bit of resistance uh, to this, this way of eating because of the eat well guidance. Um, but there are enough people out there that would really uh, uh, welcome it and welcome um, the opportunity to use people like us. So these sort of ambassadors that were up and down the UK that were volunteering their time um, to get involved and, and, and help people. You know, and I, I always thought, well, the best way to do that is to, is to get involved with as many events locally as I can. Um, so when there was an, uh, an NHS diabetes conference locally, I would go along, um, I'd do a talk, I'd get invited to do different bits and pieces at different times. And um, I really sort of got for it. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and, you know, you start to hear that other people are getting a bit of success from that as well. And of course, it's that knock on effect and they want to help other people uh, and so on and so forth. So the Public Health Collaboration, the Ambassador Programme, has just got, got stronger and stronger uh, as more and more people have either helped turn someone else's life around or, or they've turned their, their own life around um, and they want to give something back. You mentioned when you first, uh, you know, went on this sort of lower carbohydrate approach, and you noticed your your blood glucoses were much lower, and you you t you communicated with the diabetes nurse that you were working with, and she said, "Well, that's awesome. Come off the medications." Had she done what many providers do and said, "No, no, this is a dangerous diet. You need to stop the diet and, and continue eating a higher carb approach," how would have that affected you? I mean, you you know, it, it seems like. A lot of people don't get support. They come in and they've, I just had a person tell me, hey, I lost 80 pounds. My hemoglobin A1C dropped from severely diabetic to normal range after 20 years of being diabetic. My doctor chastised me for eating a diet that's too high in fat. So how, 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 how impactful was that for you to have somebody that kind of said, hey, let's come off the meds? Oh, God, it, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, obviously she had already given me that kind of go ahead and to have that support from, you know, I don't even know if they realise just how powerful they are, the diabetes nurses and, you know, and the GPs in as much as encouraging people to do it or can easily switch people off not doing it. Uh, and so, you know, if they are, if they are showing that they've got concerns, then that, that does put people off. And, and to be honest, that's what happened to me the, the couple of years before when I, when I sort of heard that you could do something about it, but I'd been put off. Um, so it was, a, it was a wasted couple of years, really, for me. Um, and, I, you know, now I look at it and I think, you know, why wouldn't people want to try this and do this? But I can see, having gone through it myself, having that support from your nurse, it really is crucial, your GP, someone who's going to give that little go on, go for it, give it a go, um, see how you get on. I'll be here to support you. Um, and, and, and uh you know that gives that really gives that confidence to uh, to patients, and we we see that now. I mean, I, I you know I've been very very lucky to work with a wonderful team of of nurses uh, locally um, after they approached me to come and help them. And uh, between us, we've we've you know really managed to get something good going uh, locally, where we've we've helped a lot of patients. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful, and thank you for doing that. Um, 
Do you know, so, and you said you're, you're still obviously plugged into the healthcare system because you're getting annual checks on your retinopathy and that type of stuff. So, I mean, I guess it's still supportive. I mean, the, the nurses and physicians at CU are fully behind what you're doing. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, in the UK, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, really, because every time you go in, you see somebody different. Um, so when I was first diagnosed, I, I had a nurse that I saw year in, year out. Now, every time you go in, you see somebody different. Um, and so you don't really get the opportunity to build up that kind of relationship. Um, and I just feel now when I speak to them, they kind of sound surprised still. Um, uh, so, you know, these aren't the nurses that I necessarily would be working with. This would be of my own surgery. Um, they, they sound surprised. Um, and, um, but, you know, even when I sort of mention and sort of try to say a little bit more and, you know, helping, helping other patients and things, it, it kind of still feel, falls a little bit on deaf ears at times. Um, and, and they might sort of nod a little but there's still that resistance and of course I think it's just from the point of view that they're, they're told something completely different um the nurses that I work with now and and the ones that I see you know uh that have had so much success it's very difficult to unsee the the benefits when you can see what it's done for a particular patient how can you turn around and say this is not good for them um and I guess that's how I feel now yeah, how has it impacted your uh, your career? You said you work in the financial sector. Um, improvements in your c- production capacity, or, or how do how do you deal with that? Um, well, I mean, I work, I, I you know, my own business now, um, and um, uh, the the great thing is, is it, it, I'm able to do this other work outside of that. So I managed to sort of go side by side. Um, and uh, although it does cross over, because I know a, a lot of my clients probably get a bit fed up with me talking about nutrition and lifestyle and that type of thing. But in all honesty, I want them to live long, happy, healthy lives. <laughs> of course, they'll be long, happy, uh, lifelong clients then, hopefully. Um, so uh, so I do talk uh, about that as well as talking about their pensions and their, their mortgages and, and everything else. But uh, uh, but yeah, I managed to to put it side by side. Um, I'd like to think because of the, the the increased energy I have, I feel like I can get more done in a shorter period of time. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But you know, it, that's how I feel. And I, you know, as whereas some people think, well, how do you find the time to do both? Is if something if there's a real passion for something, I don't see any difference between going off and playing sports. Or, if you've got a passion for running or whatever it is that you've got a passion for in life, I've got a passion for this. So that will take up the time outside of my normal day-to-day work. You know, when you originally, you know, were, were put off, you know, you said that the nurse said, Hey, you know, your, your problems are just going to come back if you go back eating the way you're used to eating. And, and some people say, well, you know, if I, if I have you drink a, a very sugary, sugary drink, your blood glucose is going to go up and therefore your diabetes is really not in remission. It's just that you're masking the symptoms. And I would, I would beg to differ, you know, given the fact your retinopathy went away, but um, do you, I mean, you still track your blood glucose. Do you ever from time to time, like, hey, I'm just going to go have this cake or whatever. And what is it, what is the impact it has on you? And uh, are you having a hard time sustaining this? Cause the, the criticism is, well, you a low carb diet is great. You can lose weight, but it's not sustainable. No one can sustain it. It's a short-term fix and no one can do it over the long term. Now, obviously, I'm being a little facetious here, but tell me about like, you know, do we ever have something where like, hey, I'm gonna have this and what happens to you? Well, I mean, I'm six years into this now. So uh I I would say the sustainability thing for myself personally is is being put to bed. Um uh and I think, you know, one I remember my brother saying to me, he said, I I, I didn't realize how unwell I felt until I felt better. Uh, and, uh, and of course you kind of want to hold on to that. You know, the last thing I want to do is to go back to see my nurse and have my numbers be going in the wrong, in the wrong direction, but I'm not absolutely perfect. I will have the odd things from time to time. So I'm, I'm not saying that, it, that, you know, it's completely screwed. I will never have a piece of cake or I'll never have this, but of course I know myself and I know that I will have that for what it is. And then the next day. I'm straight back on doing what I'm, what I should be doing again. Now I know for some people that's not 
it's easy. Um, and I think a lot of emotions come into it and that type of thing. And I think from my own personal point of view, it I feel I can manage it quite well that way. It doesn't lead to me having more and more and more uh, of the wrong things, apart from maybe the dark chocolate, which is because I thought I could have it. Uh, but clearly I, I can't. And now I put a line through that. So no, I won't bother. Um, but um, yeah, if I if I have something which I know I perhaps I shouldn't be eating, yeah, my blood sugar will, will shoot up. But then a lot of people's blood sugar will shoot up. And I think what what we've seen, especially with these sort of um, Libras, these uh, uh, freestyle Libras or whatever that people have been wearing that are non-diabetic and, and they're starting to see the effects that some of these foods are having on them. Um, and it really, really can change not not only the diabetic community, but all the others as well. Um, if we give them the right advice, they can see the effects that these foods can have on them. Um, so if they're sitting there and having a you know a bowl of porridge or bowl of whatever cornflakes or something in the morning, and they can see that steep rise. Um, and of course, I don't want to see that. Not for me. I, d I don't want that. So it, for me, it's all about keeping those nice stable uh, uh, numbers, um, and that will keep me. Keep me in a safe place, hopefully. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, you know, there's a lot of pushback in some communities about people without a diabetic diagnosis wearing a CGM. And because, you know, what we tend to do in society is we sort of have normalized pathology. You know, we're just like, well, you know, obesity is normal and feeling bad is normal and joint pain is normal and depression is kind of normal now. All these things are being normalized. But now what they're saying is you are path, you are pathologizing normal being normal physiology that is to say well yeah if you eat a banana your blood glucose is supposed to go up and it's fine and we shouldn't we shouldn't make that a pathology um and so they push back on that uh you know it's 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 something where it's a very interesting situation because i mean it may be that the, the, the monitors can diagnose a pre-diabetic or a, a hyperinsulinemic person uh help you assist that and, and sort of find these people that have these abnormal responses and maybe someone who's in better shape has a less of a response or a shorter lived response than someone else and so i do think there's some utility to this but there are you know particularly in the plant-based community there's people that saying no normal person unless they're a type 1 diabetic needs to even have a cgm which i think is you know i think you should you should be have access to the information but then know maybe how to you know, interpret that with some nuance. And I think it's just an educational type of thing. Have you played with one of the CGMs, is the Libres or the one of those? And, and how's that? How's that experience? Been? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's amazing because I mean, you know, I know some of these companies will offer sort of like a two week free trial or whatever. And I think you can learn so much just in a couple of weeks because um, I know they're not cheap to run on the on the. But but why do you need them long term um, unless you're a type one or? or whatever, uh, or insulin dependent type two, you know, you can learn so much in a couple of weeks uh, about the foods that you're eating and the effects that it has. So I think they're absolutely fascinating, but it'd be amazing, I think, what the technology is gonna produce over the, over the um, you know, the next couple of decades or whatever, you know, we're starting to hear things like smart watches and applications and that, would, that, that will be able to give you some kind of reading. Um, and if you look at the, you know, general population, what is it they're saying? Sort of 70, 80% uh, have got metabolic issues in some kind of level anyway. So, you know, even if you've got people, some people that are able to go out there and eat things that are going to spike their blood sugar and then bring them back down into normal levels, there's so much of the population that are struggling that you feel that actually that's where we need to start focusing our attention um, and, and, you know the, the processed foods, the, the things that are riddled with, with all your sugars and your refined carbohydrates, and it just really not helpful uh, when you've got a population that's so sick. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because one of the criticisms I had, and I, I think CGMs can be can be very helpful and very useful, but does it actually result in a change in behavior? Because mm -hmm. I mean, I literally have cut people's legs off. And, and that should dissuade people uh, from eating garbage, but they, they still don't stop. And to think that, well, a, a blip on a, on a little graph on my phone is going to make me stop when I won't stop when, when you're cutting my leg off. 
it's a tough thing. And, you know, addiction and, and that sort of stuff it has a powerful sway on a lot of people. And so I just wonder. It is the addiction, isn't it? It's the addiction. Well, it, and I think, you know, Jen's talked about that, isn't it? I mean, you know, we know how many, how hard it is for people to give up smoking or, you know, or alcohol or, or whatever it is. We are, we've got this kind of addictive way about us, haven't we, that we can get attached to these and the foods we, we can get attached to them. And so, you know, now, even now we talk to people and they, they look at you a bit stunned really when you're sort of saying, well, you know, ideally now we want you to start giving up things like bread and pasta and rice and, you know, potatoes and those types of things and, uh, uh, and, and start looking at the ingredients lists on, the, on these foods. And it's, you know, but these are the things that the, the, the people have been eating regularly for years and years. Um, but we make them feel as though they're at fault. You know, I mean, I was sort of looking and thinking, well, how we've created this environment where most of the things that we eat are going to be causing us some sort of harm. Um, and yet we blame the individual when they when when they're struggling with it and when they're getting metabolic conditions. Um, we've got to start giving people the right advice. But are we willing to do that? I don't know. Well, and, and it's interesting, you know, particularly the fact that a lot of these foods that are clearly harmful for people are very inexpensive and they're marketed and targeted to people nonstop and the people that don't have, uh, you know, they just don't have the financial resources. They, they, this is what they eat. And, and it's, it's a very unfortunate situation. Um, and what the answer is, I mean, you know, what the answer is and what we're willing to do is are two different things, I think. And, you know, are we willing to say these industries should be, uh, dissuaded from doing that? And, you know, I mean, then it goes into freedom of choice. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, pretty much you can do what you want to do uh but at the same time you know at least understanding uh and it's i think it starts with you know at, at the very youngest of age you know when you've got little kids you start teaching them hey this is what the impact of nutrition is on you and then you make these choices there's going to be consequences which you may not want to live with and so any, anyway interesting mark unfortunately we're running to the end of our time it has been an absolute pleasure uh it's always great to see people that are out there sharing messages like this. And I, I just thank you for doing that and uh, encourage you to continue doing that. If people are interested in the Public Health Collaborative for the UK or you're, you're finding about more about your story, where, where can people go? Well, definitely you can uh, Google the Public Health Collaboration uh, and there's lots of information there, uh, including things like the infographics that, uh, for uh, Dr. David Unwin, where he's converting foods into teaspoons of glue. Uh, of sugar or glucose um, so you can see the effects that the foods are having on on them um, we've got a, a new initiative that's we're going to be that the um, PhD conference is going to be this weekend so we're going to be introducing our new running club uh, which is all um, uh, based around trying to real food runners trying to get the message out to the community that you know we should be focusing on real foods rather than the processed food so we're, we're hoping the low carb community um uh we'll we'll embrace buying the shirts and the proceeds will go to the um the public house collaboration um and really to spread that message of you know you 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 can your life will be a lot better if you just focus on the real foods that's a wonderful message thank you very much uh the rest of y'all thank you all for being here we'll be back again tomorrow and so another guest tomorrow so you guys have a great day uh mark have a great evening uh, take care and uh, look forward to hearing more from you bye-bye now thank you